Hello, welcome to Bat Conservation International's Facebook Live event. I am Dr. Amanda Adams, and I am the Director of Research Coordination with BCI. So today we're gonna do a, a quick look, um, kind of a personal look at what I do with BCI and kind of how I got to studying bats and um, what I do with BCI. So I'm part of um, our science team. So this is a group of very amazing individuals who conduct research to study bats and ways to better conserve them. So some of our programs are studying bats and wind, um, white nose syndrome. I'm gonna be talking today about one of our programs, the North American Bat Pro Monitoring Program that we collaborate with, with USGS. And then I also run our student scholarship program. So any bat, as we call it, the North American Bat Monitoring Program is one of my favorite parts of my job. It is this uh, international collaboration of individuals that are coming together to study and monitor bats so that we can better conserve them. And essentially BCI is a strong collaborator with NABAT because our missions really tightly align. We're trying to improve bat conservation. We, this is a multi-agency, multinational, long-term monitoring program that uh, works to assess the status and trends of North America's bats. So this is not just in the US, but also in Canada and Mexico and the species found in all three countries. So the mission is to improve the state of conservation um, science for bats by having standardized protocols and unifying sampling design and integrated data analysis. So what this means is that we're able to get lots and lots of data from across the entire range of a bat species and then and standardize it in a way that we can actually look at the species as a whole rather than just a single point in time and space and having this big outlook is going to help us better um, understand what's going on to a species as a whole. As, are their populations stable? through time, are they increasing or are they decreasing and need conservation attention? Um, so BCI is, is working really tightly with NABAT and USGS to promote this program. And it has uh, four streams of data that come together to provide these status and trends. Um, these are stationary acoustic monitoring. So putting a bat detector out on the landscape and recording bats with their sound. Mobile acoustics, which are going to be driving with a bat detector and recording bats as someone drives. Uh, colony counts, so going out either in the winter or the summer and counting how many individuals are living in a particular uh, colony. And then emergence count. So going out during the summer and seeing how many bats are flying out of, of a colony. And all of these are trying to come together and understand how many bats there are, which species are where and when. And this is the really important information for conserving bats. So there are millions of records going into NA bat from across North America and BCI really works to facilitate getting those in there, making it easier for people to collaborate and get those, that data into NABAT. Um, so really my passion personally is in this acoustic box right here. So this is really where I love integrating and working with NABAT because acoustic monitoring of bats is such an amazing tool. And this really relies on the fact that bats, all of our bats in North America, echolocate. So echolocate, echo, bleh, echolocation is basically bats superpower. They are able to emit sound that then goes out into the environment, bounces off an object, and then those returning echoes 
that bounce off of an object like a moth are going to be heard by that bat. So they're gonna be listening for that returning echo to be able to hunt for insects, to fly through uh, the night and not run into trees and buildings and all of this. And so the ability of bats and how they echolocate is amazing. But then we are able to take advantage of what bats are doing with echolocation and better monitor them. So we use specialized devices called bat detectors that record at very high frequencies where the bats are producing sound above the level of human hearing and make recordings. So this is what we look at when we're uh, analyzing or processing that acoustic data. It's these pulses of sound that get recorded and we're able to look at these, these recordings and identify what species was flying by. And with that, then we can look at levels of activity, how many bats were flying um, around, how active they were in a particular area at a particular time. And um, it's amazing because we're able to get all this information without having to catch a bat, which is really hard to do. So as you can see here, this is a recording of a big brown bat. We have uh, time down here on the x-axis and then frequency in kilohertz on the y-axis. So human hearing, like the best human hearing out there is below 20 kilohertz. So what I'm saying right now, the, the, whole, the honking horns on the street, everything is gonna be down here below in this area. And then where bats are using their echolocation is above that. And you can see it goes up very high. And so these sounds will start here and then drop down. So it's kind of like a, like a, a frequency modulated um, pulse of sound. And then also what we can see in the recording, which is really neat, is this right here is going to be that returning echo that the bat is listening for. So we're actually even able to re record those returning echoes. So this is a big brown bat. These are two species that were flying past a microphone at the same time. We have a, an Eastern red bat flying. And those are, these are their calls on the, the top here. And then a hoary bats flying right here, these lower calls. So what you're, you can see is that they have very different shapes and that helps us identify which species it is. And also they're echolocating at different frequencies or pitches. So hoary bats have lower frequency calls than Eastern red bats. And we're able to look at this for all the species across North America and compare them and identify them. So it's this really powerful tool. Um, and I just have a really quick video that was recorded by Dr. Aaron Corcoran. And this is a um, Niagara's Wellens coming in. So what you just saw was a bat flying in after this moth. Here it's echolocation as it's coming in for that moth. And it's that flipping up its tail like a catcher's mitt and eating the moth out of its wing and tail membrane right before it flies on to get the next one. It's absolutely remarkable. And we're able to record that and see that the bat is out there, the species it is, and also that they're out there for it. So this is really how I got into, into bats was just being so excited by um, their echolocation and using this as a tool. But I'm gonna take a couple steps back before I knew anything about echolocation and how amazing bats were, like how I started studying bats. I'm pretty sure my parents still think I'm a little bit crazy living my life as a bat biologist, but I wouldn't have it any other way. So I'm from San Diego, California, and I did my undergraduate degree at UC San Diego. And in the third year of my degree, I um, chose to study abroad in Costa Rica. And this is where I caught my first bat, and it was a life-changing experience. So the very first bat I caught was this really special one. 
uh, trachopsirosis, so the fringe-lipped bat, and they're so neat. They specialize on eating frogs. So they have these crazy structures that allow them to have this diet of eating frogs and avoid being poisoned by biting into a poisonous frog. Um, so my very first bat I ever saw was a very special and cool one. And then as uh, the study abroad program continued, I caught some more bats and absolutely fell in love. I went back to San Diego and was like, I want to study bats. I don't care what, how, I'm gonna work with bats. And so in San Diego, I started working with bats, but then I had the opportunity to go and do my PhD working with bats and a world-renowned bat biologist in Canada. So I picked up and left San Diego and moved to London, Ontario and went to Western University where I worked with Dr. Brock Fenton and studied bat echolocation and acoustic monitoring. So this is really where I dove in and learned about using bat detectors and how amazing of a tool it is. But one of the things that came out of my research was that you can't just throw a detector out and get great data. And you can't save bats with just one detector. And I really came to the same conclusion a lot of other people were at the same time that we need standardized method methodology across a wide range to be able to study bats well because they move a lot, they have wide ranges, and we need to work at larger scales and work together. And so, the, and this is about the same time that the North American Bat Monitoring Program was, was being created. Uh, and so I'm looking back at those days, I'm very excited to now be working with NA Bat. So just a little more of my journey. After I finished my PhD in Canada, I made the semi-ambitious move or brave move and went to work in Israel at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev at a desert research station studying both bats and scorpions with Dr. Barry Pinchot. Um, and then once I was done after a couple years in Israel, I came back to the States and ended up at Texas A&M working with Dr. Mike Smotherman and studying one of the coolest bats in the world, which is a Mexican free-tailed bat. So my, my research really focused on their acoustic behavior. So I switched from using acoustic monitoring as a tool to study and understand where and what bats are doing to actually studying how they're using their echolocation. So there's kind of these two sides, understanding what the bats are doing and then using that as a tool to understand them. So at this point, I started doing some behavioral experiments with Mexican free tail bats and understanding how this very social bat is able to echolocate in groups. So this is a really quick video of one of my trained bats flying in our flight room and we have microphones there and video cameras to um, understand their echolocation as they're flying in different conditions. So once I finished my research at Texas A&M, I got my dream job. And here I am working for Bat Conservation International, the absolute best job I could ever imagine. So I'm still located in Texas and this is pretty awesome because I also get to work at arguably the best bat site in the world, which is owned and protected by BCI, which is Bracken Cave at Bracken Cave Preserve. It's about 20 miles uh, from downtown San Antonio. And the first time I ever saw this site was before I worked for BCI. I was a a BCI member. My mom knew I loved bats and paid for my, my annual um, membership as my Christmas present every year. And so once I moved to Texas, I went and got to see this spectacular sight of 20 million Mexican free tail bats leaving every night. And now, uh, now that I work with BCI, I get to go there on a regular basis and, and work with those bats almost every night. It's amazing. 
So now um, we've really come full circle. We're doing NA bat work in Texas and across the entire US and Canada and into Mexico. And we have lots of plans for the future as we continue to make it easier to participate with NABAT and um, get data in there and help grow and develop the program. Um, so please, if you're interested in learning more about NABAT, you can go to their website at nabatmonitoring.org. Um, and you can learn more about what Bat Conservation International does and our work with NABAT at batcon.org. Uh, and we're just getting started. Thank you.